This Sweets Parsha podcast is dedicated in honor of all the Torch students worldwide who are beginning the school year and their families. We look forward to a fantastic year of learning and growing. Parsha's Shoftim has 97 verses and 42 mitzvot. And you remember that we're in the portion of Deuteronomy that is very much focused on the retelling of the Torah. And there are many, many mitzvot in this central part of Deuteronomy. Some of them we've seen in the past. Some of them are brand new. And in this week's parsha, there is a emphasis on mitzvot related to leaders. It begins with judges. It talks about rebellious judges. It talks about kings. Kohanim, the priests, prophets, six kinds of false prophets, among many other mitzvot. We go back to the accidental killer. We talk about the cities of refuge. We talk about a really interesting case where a corpse is found and we don't know how it died. Very interesting partial with lots of mitzvot. It begins, judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities, which Hashem your God gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. It begins with the idea that we have to establish courts scattered throughout the land in every city and every tribe, and these are the courts that are going to oversee the adjudication and the rulings of various questions when they arise uh, amongst the people, when there's disagreements, when there are uh, other court cases that need to be done, there's going to be courts that are appointed throughout the land. Now, it's not just judges. There's also officers. Rashi tells us that the difference between a judge and an officer is that a judge is the one who renders the ruling, and the officer is like the the bailiff, if you will. He's the one who enforces it. He's the one who implements it. He is the muscle that ensures that the ruling of the judge is indeed meted out. Now, each tribe has to appoint judges from amongst its own members. And the reason for that is kind of similar to the idea that we have in in the American jurisprudence that there has to be a jury of their peers. Similarly, if you're from a particular tribe, you're more familiar with the customs of that particular tribe or that city or that locale, and therefore you're a better candidate to be a judge in that region. And I think as a broader point, you know, the idea of judges really is emblematic of the role that we play as a nation and as a species in God's world. Yes, God gives us the Torah, and yes, he delineates for us exactly what we need to do, what we ought to do, but the implementation of that is entrusted to us. And we look at judges as, you know, the ultimate partnership between us and God. Of course, it's God's Torah, but he wants us, and one of the mythos is that we should be the ones who oversee the implementation of the law of the Torah. Now, there's an important Ramban here. The Ramban tells us that today this mitzvah is inactive. And the obvious question is, you know, all the mitzvahs in the Torah, why don't we do them today? So this one we don't do today. There's no Jewish courts, or at least maybe there are some, but there isn't in every city, in every town. Uh, And the question is, of course, why? And the Ramban tells us that there's another important component, and that is the idea of smicha. Smicha means rabbinic ordination. But today we have the modern smicha is very different than the ancient smicha. The ancient smicha was when Moses, when he ordained Joshua, and that was transmitted from teacher to student for a millennia and a half until it ceased. The Romans actually made a ban against the conference of smicha. They ruled that an an individual who gives smicha, an individual who receives smicha, and an entire city in which smicha is conferred, everyone will be slaughtered. And the, the, the reason why smicha is so central, the reason why this rabbinic ordination is so central is because in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, either the big Sanhedrin of 71 justices or the minor Sanhedrin of 23 justices, and in many cases even to be a regular judge of monetary and civil cases, you need to actually have smicha. And thus, if you don't have smicha, you cannot be a judge. If you cannot be a judge, you cannot appoint judges. And therefore, the Ramban tells us that today, in modern times, you know, almost 2,000 years after smicha has ceased, there is no mitzvah for us to appoint judges and to establish courts because we cannot establish courts without the institution of smicha. Now, there's a very important Rambam. The Rambam writes that if all the rabbis 
in the land of Israel agree to reinstitute smicha, then we could reinstitute smicha even without a precedent, even without a teacher, so to speak, who got it from his teacher, who got it from his teacher all the way back to Moses. And in fact, in the 16th century, there was an effort to reinstitute the smicha. And I believe there were four rabbis who were ordained until the rabbis of Jerusalem said, no more, we don't approve of this. This has messianic undertones, and therefore the uh, the nascent uh, Samicha movement of the 16th century ended. One of the rabbis, incidentally, that was appointed with Samicha is the great Rabbi Yosef Karo, known to us, of course, as the author of the Shulchan Aruch and the Bet Yosef. So this is how the parsha begins, that we have to appoint justices and judges and courts throughout the land to give us the rulings of the Torah in questions of Doubt. Now, homiletically, there's a very uh, famous idea that this applies, or the verse can be interpreted homiletically, that we have to appoint judges in all our cities, in all our gates. That refers not just to the cities and the gates of the towns in which we live, but the gates, so to speak, surrounding our orifices. Now, sages tell us that uh, man has seven orifices, and each one of them could potentially be used for sin, you know, the the eyes and the ears and and the lips and the nose, etc. And here we're told, homiletically, that this is a reminder for us to station guards by these gates. And just like over here in the Torah, it describes a judge and an officer— someone to render the ruling and someone to implement it, we too, within our own pursuits, have to play both parts. We have to judge ourselves to make sure that we're not behaving improperly, and we have to potentially implement the rulings in the event of an infraction to make sure that such ruling does not happen and to deter such a, an event, such a sin from happening. The Talmud tells us that speech is such an important skill that really defines mankind, that it is actually given a double gate. We have our teeth and our lips. Both of them are there to help make sure that we only use our power of speech for the right reasons, and of course not for sin, not for Lashon Aran, not for evil talk, etc. There's another interesting Talmud. The Talmud talks about earlobes. Why do we have earlobes? And the Talmud tells us that the reason why we have earlobes is to cover our ears from hearing any evil talk. If someone is saying evil talk, The Almighty gave us earlobes to be able to fold over and to cover our ears so that we should not hear any of that. And that's the idea, again, homiletically, of this verse. We have to appoint on all our gates judges and officers to make sure that we do not sin. Okay, so the verse continues to give us some laws about judges. You should not pervert judgment. You should not respect someone's presence. You should not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make just words crooked. And this is an idea that bribery corrupts, even if someone does not think that bribery will corrupt them, still there is a ruling in the Torah, there's a verse in the Torah, that tells us that bribes corrupt, and therefore you should not accept bribes if you want to be a righteous judge, and of course it's prohibited. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, so they may live and possess the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. If we do nothing but have justice and righteousness in our courts, the Almighty promises that we will be able to live and possess the land, we will be able to flourish within it. The verse continues to pivot to talk about not planting idolatrous trees, any trees near the altar of Hashem, your God, that you shall make for yourself, and you shall not erect for yourself a pillar which Hashem, your God, hates. And this is a mitzvah to not build anything on Temple Mount, nor to plant anything on Temple Mount. You may say, oh, you know, Temple Mount would look really nice if it had some nice palm trees. Even if it's only for the sake of beauty, you're not allowed to plant any trees on Temple Mount. And the Ramban tells us that this was the practice of the idolaters. The idolaters would always plant at the entrance of their idolatrous temples, their pagan temples, they would plant trees, and therefore we're told not to do that, even if our intention is not idolatrous, our intention is just to beautify, we shall, we shall not do it. And then in verse 22 we read, you should not erect for yourselves a pillar which Hashem your God hates. What does it mean, a pillar? 
So Rashi tells us that there's two kinds of altars. There's one that's like a single slab of stone, like a monument or a pillar. And there's one that has many stones that are cobbled together to create one altar. We, of course, have to make an altar, but the altar has to be comprised of many stones, not a pillar of a single stone. Why? Because that was the practice of the Canaanites, of the idolaters. Even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they built monuments, they built pillars, they built built the kind of altars with a single stone, still it became the practice of the idolaters, and therefore the kind of altar that we should build, it should be an altar of many stones. Now the Ramban, he asks the obvious question, he says, wait a minute, the Canaanites also had the various kinds of altars, including a pillar, single stone altars, and many stone altars. So what does it help for us to say, oh, the Altars that we should have should be of many stones, but not the altar of one stone, a pillar, because that's the way of the Canaanites. Well, the Canaanites do both of them. So the Ramban suggests two different answers. He tells us, uh, one, he speculates that maybe the Canaanites had many more pillars than multi-stone altars. Alternatively, he tells us an interesting idea. He says there were three components of every pagan temple. Number one, there was an altar to offer sacrifices. Number two, there was a large stone platform upon which the priest, the uh, idolatrous leader, would stand. And there was also a tree planted to show the way, to, to be a marker, to show people how to get in. And he adds that even today the Christians do that. And because this is the model of the pagan temples, it is, of course, disgusted by God. However, an altar that is used for sacrifices that preceded in the world, it preceded the era of idolatry, therefore it was grandfathered in and therefore it is okay. Whereas the single stone altar and the planted tree, that became associated with idolatry, and therefore it is prohibited. Chapter 17 begins with the prohibition of pedral, which is sacrificial activities with incorrect intentions. Even though we've been told about this in the past, vis-a-vis the prohibition of consumption of such sacrifices, here is the prohibition of actually doing it. You cannot slaughter or do any one of the processes of a sacrifice with incorrect intentions. And then 17.2 tells us about the punishment of an idol worshiper. Now, again, the prohibition against idolatry is one of the central themes of Deuteronomy, and the Ramban tells us that whenever there is an introduction of a new concept, it always uses idolatry as the first example. And here it starts talking about judgment, and therefore begins with judgment of idolatry, and that is if someone does idolatry, it is a capital offense, and provided that there is sufficient testimony, that person will be executed. In verse 6, we read that the testimony has to be testimony of two witnesses or three witnesses. Either one, it could be a unit of two or it could be a unit of three. And the obvious question is, if you only need two witnesses to uphold the ruling, why does it mention three? So Rashi quotes the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that just as two witnesses comprise a single unit of testimony, so too Three witnesses comprise a single unit of testimony, and therefore, if you want to prove them as false witnesses, you'd have to prove all three of them, and it would not be enough to prove only one or two of them to render all of them as false witnesses. So suppose you do have sufficient witnesses and sufficient testimony, and the witnesses, they pass the rigorous cross-examination, intimidation that's done to them by the court, then they are executed. Who does the execution? So we read in verse 7, the hand of the witnesses shall be upon him first, upon him to death, and the hand of the entire people afterwards, and you should destroy the evil from your midst. The Talmud tells us that this teaches us that the witnesses themselves, they have to be the ones who oversee the execution. It's not something that you could just outsource to some nameless, faceless executioner. This is something that the witnesses kind of have to have their skin in the game. They themselves have to oversee this execution. There's an interesting question in the Talmud in the book of Sanjur, page 45b, because the verse says, the hand of the witnesses shall be upon him first to push him to death. And 
the question the Talmud asks, well, what if the hand of the witness gets cut off in the interim period between giving the testimony and the execution? And the Talmud suggests that indeed that may be a way to get someone off the hook because if you cannot fulfill the actual requirement of how to execute them, then you may, you may not be able to execute them at all. And then we read about the power vested in the Sanhedrin, in the members of the Jewish court, by the Torah to be the arbiters of halacha, to be the arbiters of Jewish law. If a matter of judgment is hidden from you between blood and blood, between verdict and verdict, between plague and plague matters of dispute in your city, so there's a question, we don't know the halacha, the rabbis disagree, so what do you do then? You shall rise up and ascend to the place that Hashem your God shall choose. You should travel to Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court of, of the Jewish nation, they operate on temple grounds. You go to them, and they're going to adjudicate this question. You go to the Kohan and the Levites, the judges who will be there in that day. Rashi tells us that what that means is, is that if you are part of this court, even if your stature, even if your knowledge pales in comparison to the predecessors, but still, if you are the judge in that day, you are still given this power and this legitimacy by the Torah. You should inquire, and they will tell you the word of judgment. You should do according to the word that they will tell you from the place that Hashem will choose, and you should be careful to do everything according to what they teach you, according to the teaching they will teach you, and according to the judgment they will say to you, shall you do you should not deviate, not right, and not left. So this is a mitzvah for us to obey the ruling of the Sanhedrin and not to deviate, not to the right, and not to the left, which is why the Raman tells us that the ruling of the Sanhedrin is binding for all of Israel based upon this section of the Torah that tells us that the ruling of the Sanhedrin is obligatory, it is binding, and is immutable to the entire nation. Now, it's a very interesting Rashi here, according from the Talmud, the, the verse says that we should not deviate from the ruling of a Sanhedrin, not right and not left. Says Rashi, what does that mean? Even if they tell you that right is left and left is right, we have to listen to them. And of course, if they tell us that right is right and left is left. This seems to imply that even if you're so sure that they're wrong, you're as sure as your right hand is your right hand, your left hand is your left hand, and they're telling you the opposite, still we're obligated to obey their ruling. There's an amazing Ramban here. The Ramban tells us that what the lesson here is, even if you're sure in your heart that they're mistaken, they're making an error, and the matter is so simple to you in your eyes that you are so clear they're wrong, and it's as clear to you as the distinction between your right hand and your left hand, still you should do in accordance with their ruling. And don't say, how could I possibly do this? I am disobeying the Torah. I'm doing something wrong. I'm killing an innocent man. I'm eating unkosher. Don't say that. Rather, instead, you should say, listen, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, commander of the Torah, he told me to obey this mitzvah. And this mitzvah is that I should listen to them and I should follow their ruling. And even if they are wrong, the correct thing to do is to follow their ruling. And he brings the example of the famous story in the Talmud between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Gamliel. There was a dispute that occurred between Rabbi Gamliel, who was the head of a Sanhedrin in the era following the Second Temple's destruction, and Rabbi Yehoshua was one of the uh, the heads of the rabbis in the Sanhedrin in, in Yavne. And there was a dispute concerning the determination of the day of the new moon of the month of Tishrei, which is the month that Rosh Hashanah falls out, and of course Yom Kippur falls out. Rabbi Yeshua was of the opinion that Rabbi Gamliel de- declared the new month one day early, and thus they had a disagreement as to which day was Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day of Tishrei. And Rabbi Yoshua was forced to transgress Yom Kippur, the day that he thought was Yom Kippur, in favor of the ruling of the Sanhedrin. And again, the idea is, even if they're wrong, still you have to listen to them. And the Rabban adds another point. The Rabban tells us that because this group of sages and scholars, the Almighty is with them, and therefore the Almighty is going to prevent them from making a mistake. There's a famous uh, statement from the Sefer HaChinuch, one of the medieval commentators on the Torah. He says that even if they do make a mistake, 
So what happens? You have an, an instance where there's going to be one mistake in one area of law. But that's still better than each person choosing for themselves because then you lose the sense of a nation. If the nation is not united in practice, if we're splintered, if there's different sects, if there's different factions and uh, and groups amongst the people, then we lose our identity as a nation. So it's better for us to follow Sanhedrin, to have one final say of, of what the law is, to have the final word on Jewish law, and therefore, we're all united. It's better for us to be all united with one mistake than to be each person for themselves. I heard another idea to, to understand this idea of, of even if they tell you your right is left and your left is right. And that is that, you know, if I'm facing someone, my right hand is opposite their left hand and vice versa. And maybe what it means here is that even if they tell you that your right is left and your left is right, i.e., even if they're telling you something as painful as hearing that you're facing the wrong direction, you're going in the wrong direction, you must turn around, you have to re-examine your whole life, even if they tell you something as startling as that, as painful to hear as that, we have to obey them, we have to listen to them. And then we read what happens if there is an elder, if there is a sage, if there is a judge who refuses to accept the ruling of the Sanhedrin. He is called a rebellious elder, and we read that he is executed during the festival pilgrimage. If there is a judge who comes to the Sanhedrin, he hears the ruling. Nevertheless, he goes back to his town, and he renders in opposition to the ruling given to him by the Sanhedrin, he is a rebellious elder— and we wait to the festival pilgrimage, and he is executed in front of all because everyone has to take the lesson to heart not to behave like this and to restore the sanctity of the Sanhedrin and the fact that everyone must obey their rulings. And then we read about a king. When you come to land that Hashem your God gives you and possess it and settle in it, you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the other nations. You should surely set over yourself a king whom Hashem your God shall choose from amongst your brethren, shall you set a king over yourself. So this is a mitzvah that if we appoint a king, it has to be a Jewish king. We cannot hire a Gentile to be the king over us. And then it lists many laws, many restrictions for the king. He cannot have too many horses because if you have too many horses, you may go back to Egypt. Egypt was the place where they produced the best horses and therefore to prevent the Jewish nation from forging strong allegiances and potentially pivoting back to Egypt, the king is restricted in how many horses he can have, just enough for his cavalcade, not more. He can have too many wives. Rashi tells us no more than a harem of 18 wives. Why? Because if he has too many wives, they may lead his heart astray. And he also shouldn't have too much money, not too much gold, not too much silver. That could disrupt his focus on the nation. It can make him focus too much on his Money. Now, there's an interesting teaching in the Talmud. The Talmud tells us, the book of Sanhedrin, page 21b, that generally speaking, the Torah does not reveal the reasons why we have mitzvos. Why? Because you see over here two verses that the, that the verse itself did tell us the reason why this mitzvah was commanded. And both of them, the greatest people in the world, they made a blunder as a result. Why? The verse says over here, 1717, a king shall not have too many wives because they'll lead him astray. So what did King Solomon say? I'll have a lot of wives. I'll have a thousand wives. And I'm so confident that I will not go astray. And indeed what happened when Solomon got older, his wives, they deviated his heart. He indeed fell victim to this mitzvah. And similarly, you should not have too many horses because you may go back to Egypt. Solomon says, I'll have a lot of horses and I won't go back to Egypt. And indeed, we see in the Book of Kings that he did just that. And therefore, the Torah usually refrains from revealing the reason behind the mitzvah because we may think that we're smarter than God. We could make sure we'll, we'll do it and we won't transgress the underlying reason. And therefore, 
the Almighty just hid the reason, and we're encouraged to obey the mitzvos even without a reason. When we do try to source the reasons for mitzvos, it's not an absolute classification of the reason why God, in fact, gave the mitzvah, but rather it's trying to make the mitzvahs a little bit more approachable, a little bit more relevant. And then we read how the king has to commission the writing of Torah scrolls. He can have one Torah scroll that was given to him from his ancestors and a second Torah scroll that he has to write himself or commission someone to write it for him. And one of them is always with him in the palace and one of them comes with him wherever he goes. If he leaves, it always has to travel with him. And the idea is that he should read it for all the days of his life and that he'll fear Hashem as God to observe all the words of his Torah and the decrees to perform them. The king is someone who is liable to be able to have the power get to his head and think that he reigns truly supreme. He's not just a pawn in the hand of God, and therefore he, more than anyone else, needs to be reminded of the fact that God is really the master over him as well. The Talmud tells us an interesting law that we know when we do the Amidah prayer, we bow down four times. There's four blessings that we bow down before God. If you're a high priest, you have to bow down 18 or 19 times. Every one of the blessings you have to bow down before God. Because after all, you're someone who's more exalted. And therefore, the more exalted you are, the more humility you have to have. And the more you have to humble yourself before God. A king, he has to bow down the entire prayer. The entire prayer has to be done while hunched over in deference, in subordination to God. And that's the idea over here, that he has to have the Torah scrolls, and we have to make sure that he does not become haughty, so that his heart does not become haughty over his brethren, and not turn from the commandment right or left, so that he will prolong years over his kingdom, he and his sons amid Israel. There's a famous Rambam, where the Rambam writes that a king is the heart of the nation. His role is to infuse them with pride, with fear of heaven, he has to pump the lifeblood into the nation, and therefore he cannot lord over them. And therefore he has to have these Torah scrolls and all these extra commandments. And there's an interesting Ramban here. The Ramban tells us this is the source in the Torah of the prohibition of haughtiness. This is where the Torah is hinting at the prohibition against someone being prideful, against someone being arrogant, against someone having hubris. Because if a king, someone who truly is deserving of pride, deserving of haughtiness, feeling that they earn their stature, feeling that they really are above others, if he is told to not lord over his brethren, certainly everyone else, regular, standard, lay people, they should not be prideful and arrogant over their uh, their brethren, over the rest of the people. And if indeed the king does obey these laws and does obey these guidelines given to the king. He will prolong years over his kingdom, he and his sons amid Israel. Rashi tells us that this reveals to us that a son of a king has first dibs in the succession. We believe that if the son is worthy, if he is a good candidate to be the successor of his father, the king, he would be the first one in line uh, to follow, to succeed the father. And indeed, we know throughout history, there were lines of kings, father to son, father to son, that stretched many generations because the son was indeed next up in line. Chapter 18 is going to talk about the priests and the Levites. It begins by reiterating the principle that Levites don't get a portion in the land, but instead the portion of God, that's their inheritance, and that is what they eat. He should not have an inheritance amongst his brethren. Hashem is his inheritance as he spoke to him. So this is, again, an idea that the Levites, they're the clergymen, they're the ones who don't get a portion in the in the physical land, but they are part of the spiritual realm. They're the clergymen, they're the leaders of the people, and therefore the Jewish nation is tasked with ensuring that they are taken care of. They're providing for us spiritually. We provide for them materially and physically. And then it talks about the gifts of the Kohen. There are various items that must be given to the Kohen. It begins with talking about the three parts of the animal that go to the Kohen. You should give the Kohen the foreleg, the jaw, and the maw. And the first of the grain, the wine, the oil, the first of the shearing of the flock, those are all given to the Kohen. 
The Rabban tells us that this is a mitzvah that's only pertinent to the nation once they enter the land. Why? Because in the wilderness, the sacrifices were not done from animals that have this law. The the ox and the flock, those were not done as sacrifices, and therefore only as they're about to enter the land, there's this mitzvah that the three parts of the animal go to the coin when it's this particular animal. And then we read about the truma, which is the first tithe, if you will, that is given to the coin. It's one fiftieth or one fortieth or one sixtieth of your grain, your wine, and your oil. And then the first of the shearings shall be given to the Kohen. And the, the Rambam tells us, it's quoted actually by the Ramban here, that what this is revealing to us, that the first part of any endeavor is consecrated to the spiritual given to the Kohen. So, of course, you have Truma over here. You have Chala, which is the mitzvah of giving the first portion of the dough to the Kohen. You have the Bikurim, it's the first fruits, the first of the shearings. All that is given to the Kohen in order that we bolster our attribute of generosity. The first thing, the first fruit, the first yield that we have, we're so excited about that, and we right away direct that to the to the Kohen, we consecrate it for the spiritual. And similarly over here, it talks about the three parts of the animal. It's the it's like the shoulder, which is the first of the appendages. It is part of the stomach, which is the first part of the internal digestion system. It is the, the cheats where, where the animal chews. Again, everything that's first, we right away give it to the Kohen. And then we read a whole list of things that we're not supposed to do in emulation of the Canaanites. When you come to the land that Shem your God shall give you, don't learn to act according to the abominations of these nations. And it lists, don't do child sacrifice. There should not be found among you one who causes his son or daughter to pass through the fire. And again, there's a dispute in the Talmud whether or not the child is actually killed. This is already referenced in Leviticus 18. Don't do divination. Don't do sorcery. Don't do black magic. Don't assign certain times as being particularly auspicious. Don't be superstitious. Don't say, well, you know, my bread fell on the ground. Oh, there's a cat. This will bring bad luck. Oh, the mirror broke. That's also bad luck. My uh, stick fell out of my hand. That means this. That means that. Don't do various forms of necromancy. This is the methods of the nations. They hearken to astrologers and diviners. But as to you, no, you have a Shem, your God, and you have a prophet. The only way that they could find any cosmic guidance is by trying to use all these shortcuts. But no, we have God and we could be simple. We could be wholehearted. We could walk with God. We don't need to seek out any shortcuts. There's a very fascinating, a very long essay here in the Ramban about magic and sorcery and how it actually worked and why it's wrong for us. And there's Urbana Baha'i who quotes the Ramban and adds some other spooky ideas about sorcery and necromancy. Everyone could study it uh, on their own time at their own peril. And then it talks about prophets and how we determine, how we vet if someone is a legitimate prophet. And once we have a legitimate prophet, the obligation that we have to hearken to the prophet. And here Moses tells us, verse 15, a prophet from your midst, from your brethren, like me, Shall Hashem your God establish for you, to him you shall hearken. We don't need divination. We don't need gurus. We don't need sorcerers. We don't need necromancers to know what God wants. We have a prophet. We have the direct divine guidance. I will establish a prophet for them from among their brethren like you, God said to Moses, and I will place my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them everything that I will command him. Here Moses is informing us that in the future, there's going to be prophets that are going to succeed Moses and again to be this conduit between God and the Jewish people. And it shall be that the man who will not hearken to my words that he shall speak in my name. So if you have a case where someone does not listen to the words of the prophet, I will exact from him. God is promising to get even with someone who refuses to obey and to hearken to the words of the prophet. But what about a false prophet? But the prophet who willfully shall speak a word in my name, that which I have not commanded him to speak, or shall speak in the name of gods of others, that prophet shall die. 
And Rashi tells us that there's actually six different kinds of false prophets, three of them that get executed. Number one, someone who prophesies what he did not hear, God did not command him. One who prophesies what God told a different prophet, but not to him. And thirdly, if someone prophesies in the name of an idol, these three are capital offenses that are executed in a court of law. There's three others that are also executed, but not by people, by God. And that is number one, someone who withholds their prophecy. So that's someone who has conveyed a prophecy by God, but they refuse to convey that to the people. Someone who transgresses the word of the prophet, and finally, a prophet that transgresses his own word, then God promises to get even with these people, but it is not overseen. It's not adjudicated by a human court of law. And then we read about how to vet a prophet. So someone comes and makes a prophetic claim. How do we know if they're legitimate? Maybe they're a charlatan. Maybe they're not a true prophet. So we read about how they have to predict the future, and it must be precise. And if indeed it repeatedly happens that they are able to predict the future, then we know that they are indeed a prophet. If it, they're off or if their prediction is not precise, then we can be certain that they indeed are a false prophet. Chapter 19 begins with the three other cities of refuge. Moses, of course, designated three cities of refuge that are going to be on the east bank of the Jordan, where the two and a half tribes of Reuven, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. There's going to be three cities, permanent cities of refuge, where someone who is an accidental killer is obligated to go and find refuge to spare himself from the revenge of the relative of the person they killed accidentally. And then once you settle down the land, you have to appoint three other cities in Israel proper where someone who is an accidental killer, they go and they seek refuge there until the death of the high priest. And we read the importance of placing markers, directing a person there. So there has to be like on the road signs to aid the accidental killer in getting there quickly. These cities should be equidistant from each other and to the border so that an an accidental killer can always hustle over there quickly. You don't want to bunch them in one area, one region, and cause someone who lives far away uh, the hassle and the danger of trying to get over there without being accosted and potentially threatened by the relative of the deceased. And once someone is there, it is a mitzvah for them to have all the amenities so that they could flourish in their new homeland. The verse says, he shall flee to one of these cities and live. In that city, it has to be a city that all the amenities of, of normal life are, are, are present. That way he could live and he could flourish there. So the Talmud goes on to say that this includes also spiritual life. His rabbi, his spiritual infrastructure has to follow him there. That way he could truly live, not just live physically, but live spiritually as well. We read about the fact that the city of refuge does not help a willful murderer. If someone is a willful murderer, they actually try to kill someone, they kill them, then going to the city of refuge would not save them from judgment. The Talmud tells us that initially... Anyone who kills someone else, whether it is willful or accidental, right away they go to the city of refuge, and then the court will go and take them from there and to determine if this was indeed a willful murder or accidental. And if it was indeed a willful one, that would be a capital offense, and they could potentially be executed. And then we read about land theft by moving landmarks. You shall not move a boundary of your fellow which the early ones marked out in your inheritance that you shall inherit in the land that Hashem your God gives you to possess it. So you and your neighbor, you each have a portion of land and there is a marker separating the two. And in the middle of the night, you could surreptitiously move the marker a yard into his property and then disguise it so they can't tell. That is a prohibition of the Torah, not to steal in that fashion. Now, the obvious question is, that, well, isn't that included in the regular prohibition against stealing? Why is there a specific mitzvah to not steal land by moving landmarks? And the rabbi explains that there are people who are likely to question the legitimacy and the fairness of the division of land. They may say, hey, each person is supposed to receive the same amount of land 
in the land of Israel? Why does my neighbor have a bigger land? It's not fair. And of course, this was done by the prophet. This was done via the word of God. It was done via the lottery like we spoke about in the past. But still, someone could question it, and therefore, that's be a specific mitzvah, a specific verse to prohibit land theft by moving the borders between you and your neighbor. And then we read about the minimum of two witnesses for any ruling. A single witness shall not stand up against a man for any iniquity or for any error regarding any sin that he may commit by the testimony of two witnesses or by the testimony of three witnesses shall shall a matter be confirmed. Rashi tells us that even though you need a minimum of two witnesses for a ruling, even a single witness can compel an oath. So for example, two people come to court. One guy says, you owe me $100. And the other guy says, no, I don't owe you anything. And the original person brings a single witness, not two witnesses, single witnesses testifying that indeed he does owe him $100. So while this single witness cannot compel the person, the litigant, to pay, it could compel him to swear an oath that indeed he did not borrow that $100. And then we read about false witnesses. This is a case where witnesses, they make up a story, they concoct a story, then the ruling is that if they're found to be guilty, the witnesses, that they conspired to make up a testimony, their punishment is that they get what they tried to inflict upon the accused. So if they wanted to make him pay a monetary fine, they themselves pay the monetary fine. If they wanted to have him punished by caning, by lashes, by even a capital crime, they get exactly what they tried to inflict. Now, there's a very interesting idea here that these false witnesses, they get what they conspired to give. The verse is very clear. After the judges inquire... And indeed, they could prove that it was false testimony. You shall do to him as he conspired to do to his fellow. And the Talmud explains that you do to him what they conspired to do, but not what they actually did. So for example, let's say two witnesses come. They say this person is a murderer. We have evidence. We have testimony. And they're inspected in the rigorous in interrogation, cross-examination by the court, indeed, the person's found guilty and they're executed. The day after the accused was executed, two more witnesses come and they say, no, these two witnesses, they're false witnesses. They weren't even there at the time of the alleged crime. And indeed, these people prove that the original two witnesses were lying, false witnesses, and now there's a dead accused, he was actually killed by the court as a result of the testimony of the false witnesses. In that case, when the ruling, when the punishment was already meted out, it's too late and we can no longer punish the false witnesses. And the obvious question is, you know, if they get what they conspired to give, but they didn't actually give, shouldn't they get what they actually gave? So there's a stunning Ramban here. The Rabban gives two reasons why if their evil intent, the evil intent of the false witnesses, if it was actualized, they don't get that punishment. So he says, first of all, he introduces the idea that the fact that we believe the second set of witnesses who are accusing the first set of witnesses as being false, the fact that we believe the second set above the first set, that is just a decree of God. It means these are two people that we don't assume they're lying. And these are two people that we don't assume that they're lying. So why do we believe the second set over the first set? That is a decree of God. Okay, so there's no real logical reason why one group should be more believable than the second group. And then he adds, when two people come and they testified that Ruvain killed someone and two other people come and they say, you're false witnesses, you weren't there, we know for sure that you guys are lying. The law is that so long as Reuven was not actually killed, was not executed as a result of the alleged crime, we say in the merit of Reuven, Reuven was really innocent. That's why the falsifying witnesses came, because the Almighty prevented the innocent from being executed in Jewish court of law. However, what happens if the witnesses come, the falsifying witnesses come after Reuven was already executed? We tend to believe 
that indeed the first ones were telling the truth. Why? Because otherwise the Almighty would not have allowed Ruvain, who was innocent, to be executed, and only after he's executed do the falsifying witnesses show up. If Reuven was truly innocent, then the witnesses that claim that the first witnesses are liars, they would have showed up before the punishment was meted out. So it must be that Reuven indeed was guilty. And in this case, we don't have a reason to believe the second set of witnesses over the first set of witnesses. And then he adds a second reason. He says that the Almighty is going to give strength and going to give wisdom and merit to the judges to prevent them from spilling innocent blood. Because judgment truly, it's the work of God. And God is there among the judges. They're his partners. And therefore, it's a promise from God that he agrees to what they're doing and they're acting correctly. And therefore, he's going to make sure that they're not going to render an incorrect ruling. A very powerful idea that the Almighty is there with the court. It's not just humans acting on their own. The Almighty is there with them, making sure that they're going to oversee and adjudicate correctly. Chapter 20 talks about the Jewish people's attitude towards war. When you should go out to battle against your enemy... And you see a horse and a chariot, a people more numerous than you. Don't fear them, for Hashem, your God, is with you. He brought you out of the land of Egypt. It shall be that when you draw near, then the Kohen shall approach and speak to the people. So we have God on our side. And they're coming with the strength of of flesh and blood. We're coming with God. We've got on our side. We're confident that we're going to win. Rashi brings over here. The fact that the Philistines, they showed up with Goliath, this monstrous behemoth of a warrior. And what happened? He fell and his nation fell. Why? Because we have God on our side. Now, it's interesting. Rashi tells us, when you go to battle against your enemy, and the verse here is reminding us that we have enemies. And we have to treat them like enemies. We're not used to this. We're a nation of of docile people. We're a nation of peace-loving people. And it's very much against our characteristic, our nation, to realize that there are people that hate us and that want to do merciless things to us. And here Rashi tells us, we have to view these people as our enemies. We cannot show them mercy because they will not show us mercy. And Rashi adds that you should see a horse. The verse says you should see a horse and a chariot. It's not, you don't have to see one horse. You can see lots of horses. Rather, what it's reminding us is that you should, when you see hordes of horses, you should treat them all as if they are one horse because in the, in the eyes of God, they're nothing more than one horse. So as we're about to go into war, the Kohen gives a speech to the people, inspiring them. He should say to them, hear, O Israel, today you're coming here to battle against your enemies. Let your heart not be faint. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't be broken before them. For Hashem, your God, is the one who goes with you. He's going to fight with you against your enemies. He is going to save you. After that inspiring speech, the officers get up and they begin this really strange selection process to determine who is going to go out to war. They say, who is the man who has built a new house but has not inaugurated it? Go back to your house. You're someone, you cannot concentrate on the war. You built a house, you're thinking about it, you're worried about it, you're worried someone else is going to live in it, go back to your home. Whoever planted a vineyard, didn't redeem it, go back home. Whoever betrothed a woman and did not marry her, go back home. And finally, who is the man who is fearful and faint-hearted? If you're scared, go back home. And after that strange selection process, anyone that recently built a home, recently planted a vineyard, recently betrothed a woman, or is steered for any reason, go back home and whoever remains is going to go into war. There's a very interesting Rashi here in verse 9. What does it mean someone is fearful or faint-hearted? So Rabbi Tiva, he says that this is understood simply. He's steered of the war, he's steered of the outstretched, brandished swords, and therefore he doesn't have the fortitude to withstand this conflict, and therefore he should go back home. Rabbi Yosa Glili says, again, this is quoted by Rashi, what does it mean someone who's fearful? They're fearful 
of the sins that are in their hands. They're fearful, the fact that they are not perfect in their spiritual lives, and therefore they're worried maybe they won't have the divine protection and maybe they will suffer and they'll fall in war. And then Rashi adds a very powerful idea. Why is someone who plants a vineyard, someone who builds a home, someone who betroths a woman, why do they go back home? That's really to give cover, to save face for all the people that are going home because of the sins that they have. We don't want to embarrass people. We don't want people to say, yeah, I kind of have some sins. I really am not confident in my spiritual standing, but I don't want everyone to know that. And therefore, I'm just going to stay here and battle because it's so embarrassing for me to admit that I'm a sinner. And in order to prevent people from having that shame and to make sure the people who are not worthy of battle in this kind of battle, to show that they go home, we're able to give them cover and say, well, maybe they're going home because they built a house. Maybe they planted a vineyard. Maybe they betrothed a woman. And therefore, that's the reason why they're going home, not because of their sins. And then we read about the requirement to do peace overtures, to reach out and offer peace terms before any war can happen. Now, there's a very important Ramban here. The Ramban says that even the seven Canaanite nations, the nations that we're told that we have to go and conquer their land, we first must offer them peace terms. We have to make sure that they want war before we give them war. And if they do opt for war, then it's, yes, it's a total war. We have to kill them all. But if they choose peace terms, if they leave, or even if they stay, provided they commit to abandon idolatry, then we have to extend those offers. And indeed, the Ramban here quotes the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that Joshua actually followed these instructions. When he arrived to Canaan, he sent a messenger to each place that he went that he wanted to conquer, and he would write, whoever wants to make peace, come make peace. Whoever wants to leave, could flee, could leave. And whoever wants to do war, you are welcomed to do war. And indeed, the Girdashites, they left. The Gibbonites, they made peace. And there were 31 kings that, that wanted to do war, and indeed they did war, and the Almighty made sure that they fell. Now, there's a little bit of a troubling verse to modern sensibilities in verse 16. In the event that they choose to do war with us, from the cities of these people that Hashem, your God, gives you as an inheritance, you shall not allow any person to live. This seems to imply that we have to really kill everyone, even the people that we would call today civilians or people that are non-combatants. And I think there's maybe a few ways to understand this. One of the commentaries notes that we're conquering their land, and therefore even if there is someone who's not a soldier, but someone who may lay a claim to that land, and therefore we have to get rid of those people as well. That's one idea. I think another idea is that this is not a human war. This is a war of God. This is not a war that we're acting, we're fighting. It's not our choice to do it. We're executing the will of God, and therefore it's not really advice or guidance how we should wage war. Rather, it is us acting as the extension of God, so to speak. Now, there is also an Ibn Ezra here who seems to say that it doesn't mean that we have to kill everyone. It just means we, we cannot allow them to live. We have to pr- withhold from them food, withhold from them water, but not actually to put them down. But regardless, it is a little bit of a troubling verse, certainly to modern sensibilities or modern conventions of, of war. But there is an important verse here later on, in the event that they do repent, they can indeed remain. Why are we told to get rid of these nations? Verse 18, so that they will not teach you to act according to their abominations that they performed for their gods, so that you will sin to Hashem, your God. And Rashi tells us that indeed, if they repented, if they convert, if they commit themselves not to an idolatry, they can remain. We read about the prohibition of destroying fruit trees. This is in a case where we want to have a scorched earth policy. You're not allowed to destroy fruit trees. And there's a famous uh, verse over here in verse 19. When you besiege a city for many days to wage war against it, to seize it, do not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against it. For from it you will eat 
you should not cut it down, for man is the tree of the field. And here, the famous uh, motif here, that man is compared to the tree of the field, we too have portions of ourselves that are subterranean, that are beneath the surface, and we have parts of us that are revealed. And this is, of course, a big idea in in the, the whole uh, study of character, that what we exhibit to the world outside of us is not necessarily who we truly are. And there's another idea, and that is that we're like a tree, but we're like upside down, that our roots are in heaven, and over here, when we are in this world, we are distant from our roots. Okay, so chapter 21, the final chapter of the Parsha, talks about the unsolved murder, where you have a corpse that is found, and you don't know what happened to it, who killed this person. We didn't know the history, the backstory, we just have the dead body. So what do you do in that instance? You have to measure to the closest city to find out which is the city that's most likely to be responsible. Once you determine which city is nearest to the corpse, the elders of that city, they take a heifer, they take a small cow, no work's been done in it, it hasn't been pulled with a yoke, and they bring the heifer to a rocky valley, a valley that again cannot be worked, cannot be sown, They take an axe to the back of its neck and they kill it in the valley. Very strange process here. We'll see more about uh, why this is done in a second. And the Ghanim, they they come and they oversee this process where the elders of the city, the ones of the the city that was close to the corpse, they wash their hands over the heifer and they declare, our hands have not spilled this blood, our eyes did not see it. And they make a prayer, atone for your people, Israel, You have redeemed, O Hashem, do not place innocent blood in the midst of your people, Israel. And the blood shall be atoned for them. This is a very strange idea over here that you find a corpse and you don't know why it died. You don't know the the origin, the backstory, what happened. The closest city, they have to do this very strange ritual where they're killing this animal, this heifer in a barren place in order to atone for this sin. So Rashi tells us that the the lesson here is that you should take a baby heifer that didn't really do anything, didn't have any fruits of its labor, or never pulled a plow, and never did any work, and let it be killed in a place that doesn't do any work, that doesn't produce any yield. And that will be an atonement for the fact that this person died or this person was killed and was not allowed to yield any fruits. Another very important Rashi here, Rashi asked the question, you know, the elders of the town, they have to wash their hands and they have to declare that we did not spill this blood. Do we really think for a second that the elders of a town are murderers? Of course not. So why are they washing their hands and declaring that they didn't spill this blood? Rather, what Rashi says, what it means is that we did not see him and let him go without any food and without any accompaniment. It's considered bloodshed by the Torah standards if someone comes to your home and they're hungry and you give them no food and no encouragement and then they go and they die even if you didn't kill them directly, but you didn't give them the strength, the support, the food, the encouragement to be able to survive, and therefore it's somewhat attributable back to you. Now, there's a very important idea here brought down by the commentaries uh, based upon the Rambam. The Rambam explains what's the reason for this mitzvah. Why are we bringing the whole town together and we're taking an axe to the back of the heifer What's the meaning behind this very strange ritual? And the answer is, it's to get the people to divulge what they know. It's possible there's a murderer here. It's possible there's someone who's acting in a very egregious way. But people are silent. People who know what's happening, and they don't want to reveal. So we bring them over here, and they have to witness this very gory and this very startling ritual, and that's going to awaken their mind. And that's going to encourage them to divulge what they know to the elders and to determine who the murderer is and to bring him to justice. I want to end with an idea from Rabbi Tzadok, 
the Mishnah tells us that there was a question, which part of the anatomy of the corpse is used to measure to which city is closest. So Rabbi Eliezer says you measure from the person's stomach and find the city that's closest to his stomach. Rabbi Kiva says you measure from the nose. And Rabbi Elizabeth Azariah, you measure from the throat, i.e., which part of the body is the one that's used to determine to which city it is closer. So you could have theoretically a situation where the person's stomach is closer to one city, but their nose is closer to a different city. So that's the dispute, that's the debate in the Talmud. So Rabbi Sarich says that this is an argument as to how we're supposed to encourage other people. Rabbi Elizabeth Azari says that we have to measure from his throat. When someone's going through something difficult, a difficult time, you have to listen to them. You have to determine how you can help them, what is the source of their hardship. Rabbi Kiva, he says, you measure from the nose. Sometimes people, they don't actually reveal what they're going through. You have to look at their nose. Are they looking down? Are they looking to the side? And that's how you have to determine what's wrong with someone. And finally, Rabbi Lezer says, you have to look at their stomach, meaning that there's some people that they're not going to speak and, this, and say what's wrong with them. They're not going to even demonstrate with their nose what's wrong with them. They harbor it all in their stomach, and you have to actually search to, to determine whether or not there's something wrong with that person. And that's, the, again, an idea which is very appropriate for this time of year, the time of Elul. We're trying to always improve ourselves in the run-up to Rosh Hashanah and the High Holy Days. It's important for us to always be on the lookout for other people to monitor how they're doing and to see whatever it is we could do to help them break out of their malaise. Thank you all for listening. The email address is rabbiwolbygmail.com. I look forward to speaking to y'all next week.